We're now going to look at starting. First thing about a start is starting at the right end of the line. There are two main ways of uh, working out which end of the line is biased, i.e. furthest upwind. One good way is to sail up and down the start line, sail down it on one jibe, set your main sail correctly for sailing down it on that jibe, then jibe round, come back the other way. If you need to pull your main sail in, you're heading towards the biased end. If you need to let your main out, you're heading away from the biased end. The other way is to team up with a friend and do a trial run. One start at one end, one at the other, see who comes out in front. Here you can see that NZL2046, Alistair Deves, has done his homework. He's the only one starting at the port end, but he's probably going to cross the whole fleet. What a nice feeling. Tacks just underneath them. He does need some help with his tacking though. We'll come on to that later. The last 20 seconds before the start are an absolutely key time as you'll see here. Ideally you want to sit about a boat length or two behind the line so you've got room to accelerate. However that doesn't always happen because everyone pushes forward. If everyone's pushing forward too early what you want to do is keep your bow just behind the bows of everyone else so then the race officer can't see you so he can't call you for being over the line and also you've got room to accelerate more than the other boats you'll come off the line faster now in this clip look at 2075 early on he's realized he's over the line but rather than bearing off back behind the line so he's got room to accelerate up again he just reaches along the line you want to dip right down below and start again This is about 20 seconds after the start. Look how many boats are sitting in dirty wind. If you get a bad start, key to tack out straight away. Bad start will only lose you a boat length or two. Bad start and dirty wind will lose you 10. Now the key thing at the start is to have room to accelerate when the start gun goes. Now the way to do that is to pick on a couple of boats above you, take them up really high so that then you create room beneath you. So you see here the white boat to lure to these three is almost head to wind you're allowed to go all the way up to head to wind and is stopping these two boats above him keeping them held there keeping them held there and then shortly with about 10 seconds to go off he goes accelerates then at the start guns at full speed now let's look at this again and uh, think about what the blue boat and the varnish boat could have done. Right, at this point now, they've got about 30, 40 seconds to the start. The thing they want to do now is get out. They're in a hopeless situation there. So they want to actually push their booms out, go backwards, and then duck below the other boats and reach down the line, get some speed up, and they can still get a good start. But now, with t 20 seconds to go, it's too late. They're stopped. These stop boats start to accelerate now, but as you can see it's too late and they're about three boat lengths behind when the start gun goes. This is a start at our French and Pond open meeting. You can see we've got a very port bias start line. Okay, the boats coming along on starboard tack are actually going to struggle to lay the port end, so it's very port biased. Now here the fleet's very, very tame in coming for that port end, so the boat with no numbers is allowed to totally control the start. He's the boat nearest the end, and he picks when he wants to go for that end. No other boat tries to have a go at it, so he can time his run for that end. The key thing to getting this right, though, for the boat with no numbers, is that he's already done a run before you see all of this, to know how long it's going to take to get to that end, so that then he can hit the gun right on time. There he did a run, he decided he was a bit early, so just stopped. And then said, right, gun's coming up, now let's go. And as the start gun goes, bang, tax, clears the fleet. What everyone else needed to do was go in for that end as well. Everyone else was very tame for getting to that end. So the boat with no numbers already got a three boat length lead. We'll now see a very windy weather tack. When it's very windy, you do have to use a bit more tiller or your boat will get stuck in irons. See there, much more positive 
tiller movement by Dave to get it through the tack. Another tack here though, Dave does it just as he hits a wave, bang, so the boat stops dead. Make sure you don't tack when you're hitting a wave. This time, Dave times his tack for a bit of flat water so that the boat stays on the move. Here is Terry about to tack in a lot of wind. Lesson here is never let go of your tiller extension. Let's it go halfway through the tack, loses control. Here is Peter Wibro from Denmark performing a beautiful tack. Really graceful movement as he goes through the tack, all very smooth. Boat will keep moving fast, there's no juddering. Smooth movement through the tack, straight out onto the toe straps. Lovely tack. Contrast this with a tack by Robert, where halfway through the tack, he hesitates, slows up, and the whole boat stops. Hesitation here, doesn't go straight out onto the straps. Now for some lighter wind tacking. We're going to see a few pretty good tacks here, and then one really atrocious one where there's way too much tiller used. This is quite a nice tack from Dave. Not a bad tack from Greg in the background, but look how much tiller on that. Boat stops dead in the water, and he's sitting way too far back coming out of it. We're going to look at one of my tacks now and look at what's good about it and what's bad about it. Here it comes up in slow motion. Now what's good about it is not much tiller used. As I go in, I just sit up a little bit, let the boat heel away from me a little bit so that the boat steers itself, let the tiller follow the boat, so never more than the tiller halfway over. Then halfway through, look how I flick the extension across so it's on the new side straight away and then power it out the tack. So good tap because not much tiller used at all. Right, now let's take a, look, take a look at what Nick did wrong in the tack. He's looking quite good going into it. Rolls the boat over quite nicely. It's fine there. However, on his way up, he seems to slip a bit. The boat rolls too far over and slips sideways. And he has to pull the tiller over too much at the end, losing a bit of boat speed. Never mind, darling. Watch here for how much rudder that Terry's using. Whilst it's very windy, so you do need to use more tiller to keep your boat in control and get through the waves, you'll see from Dave that you don't need to use as much as Terry's using. Now here's Dave. See how much less tiller he's using than Terry was, even though there's some very big waves here. Also, look how much body movement Dave is using. He's going backwards and forwards a lot. What he's trying to do is match his timing of his body movement to the timing of the waves so that the boat never crashes over a wave, moves over them all smoothly. So you see that his backward and forward movement is more or less in time with the size and frequency of the waves. Right, now let's look at some beating. Here we've got very difficult conditions. It's quite light winds and it's quite choppy. So very difficult to get through. We've got Dave Carroll going upwind here. As you can see, he's using quite a lot of tiller. See how much his tiller's going backwards and forwards to get him through those waves. Also, have a look, boat's healing a fair bit. If you look at the transom, you'll see that the leeward chine is in the water, the windward one's out. So a fair bit of heel on the boat. Now here's me going upwind with quite a different style. I'm sailing the boat a lot, lot flatter and using a lot less tiller. Now if you can get away with this, it's a faster way of getting upwind. But it is quite hard to get upwind in this chop without using too much tiller. You've got to use a lot more body movement to make up for the fact that you're not using your tiller as much. So as you look at the uh, chines of the boat, the windward chine and the leeward chine just around that rudder, about the same amounts in the water. Boat's really flat. The other thing that I'm doing a little bit differently is sailing with really, really tight toe straps. So even though there isn't much wind at all, I'm hiking quite a lot of the time. Now that helps because you get a lot more feel for the boat if you're locked into it and having to lean out with a gust. 
you, you know a lot more what the wind's doing that way. It's light winds now, so most people think of light winds as a time when you don't have to work very hard. But watch Dave here, how much work he's doing to get that boat over the waves without it crashing. So he's moving backwards and forwards, in and out as the wind increases and decreases to keep the boat flat at all times and keep the bow going over those waves. See there, body going back, back to get it over wave. Forward a little. Now he's going back, forward again, back, forward again, back. So lots and lots of body movement. You might think that these tiny little movements don't make much difference, but remember that you weigh more than your boat, so they do, especially if you've got a belly the size of Dave's. Oops, think he heard that one. We're now uh, on to reaching. We can see here Dave going down a reach. And you see that he's uh, heeling his boat ever so slightly to windward so that then he's not having to use any rudder. The boat's perfectly balanced. His rudder is about in the middle. Reason for this is he's getting his rig above his centerboard so that all the forces are in balance. There's a bit more wind now, so you can see that Dave is planing. Note how much further back he's sitting. He's sitting right at the back of his cockpit. Also look for how when he comes off the plane, he moves forward again to keep the uh, boat moving fast. When you're going fast and planing, you want to be right at the back so that the boat's on the flat surface at the back, which is designed for surfing. When you're not planing like now, Dave sat further forward so that the bit of the boat that's in the water is the pointy front end, which cuts through the water better at low speeds. There's now less wind, so it's marginal planing conditions. All these people are sitting too far back in their boats. They're sitting as if they were planing, when in fact, most of the time, they're not. So they need to be sitting much further forward. Also, see how static they are in their boats. They're relatively still. We'll now look at a couple of clips where you'll see someone sitting in the right place in their boat, and then you'll see someone putting in the right amount of pumping to get the boat planing in these conditions. Now watching Greg Casey going down a reach and you can see that his boat trim's just right. He's not planing so he's sitting near the front of his cockpit but you can see that his shoulders are moving backwards and forwards a fair bit as he gets the boat almost onto the plane in these lighter weathers. Now this is the best example of reaching in these conditions. You can see how much more Dave's pumping and moving than anyone else. It's not illegal because he's only doing one pump per wave but he is doing that one pump per wave and getting a lot more out of his boat than anyone else we've seen so far. Here I am uh, of course deliberately showing what might be seen as excessive pumping by a jury. Every jury differs their in their interpretation of the rules so it's quite a hard one to know but what I'm doing here is using lots of body movement, which is the thing that a jury always looks for. My pumping of the main cell itself probably isn't illegal, because I'm still only doing one per wave. Each pump's a big one, but the rules don't say anything about how big the pump's allowed to be. So the main cell pumping's probably legal, but the body movement, probably excessive, and would cause a jury to come over and wave the yellow flag at me. Here is Greg Casey with a fine example of how to steer an OK up and down waves. The rescue boat's going in a straight line. What you'll see is Greg getting nearer to the rescue boat and further away as he steers with the waves. So as he comes off a wave like now, he's getting closer because he's luffing up. And then when he gets a wave, he's bearing off, riding with the wave and planing for as long as possible. So off he goes downwind, and he's off the wave. So he luffs up, gets closer, closer, and he gets the wave again, about to get a big wave now and he bears off with the wave and off he goes, stays on the wave longer and planes for longer. Excellent reaching there. As well as excellent steering by Greg, the other thing you can see that he does well here is a very well timed pump. So just the wave hits, now big pump accelerates down the wave. Look at how not to do a windy weather jibe. 
The driving when it's windy, think that you've got an elephant chasing you. If you slow up, the elephant's going to catch you and knock you over. Exactly the same with the wind. This guy slows right up, so the wind catches him up, bang, knocks him over. This is Robert Deves about to go into a jibe. The thing to look for is how much tiller he uses in the jibe. Using tiller is slow because any movement in the rudder slows the boat up. See, as he goes in here, look for how far over the tiller it is. Almost all the way over. And then as he comes out the jibe, he stands up and there's another large tiller movement. You see now the tiller going right over. We'll now compare this with another jibe and you can see how little tiller you can use on a jibe. Here's Greg Casey about to do an excellent jibe. He uses heel rather than tiller to turn the boat and as he comes out the jibe he brings the boat dead flat so the tiller stays central. This is me about to jibe. The thing to look for is to pump out the jibe. I bring it up as vigorously as I can but not so hard that the boat comes over on top of me and the sails collapse. So it's a vigorous pull up but the boat stays flat. It's now very windy. See how Dave's taken power out his rig by letting his kicker off. The boom's high up, the leech is loose. And he does it while staying upright. Here's Terry Curtis going downwind, still extremely windy. And you can see in slow motion there here that he's just struggling to get control of his boat. But what he does before he jibes is make sure he's got it in control and level before he goes into the jibe. So you see he just holds on for about 10 seconds and when it's in control in he goes for the jibe. And again like Dave at the end of it it's that windy that he's going to struggle to control it coming out of the jibe so he just lets his main go so he's got through the jibe safely. And here's that wonderful jibe again at full speed. It's light winds on the run, it is important to work your body to help your boat get down the run as fast as you can, just like on the reaches. See here, this chap in the green boat, very stationary, not much movement at all. And this white boat, again, body dead still. Now contrast this style with Dave Carroll going down the run. What he's doing is every time he gets a wave, He's letting the boat heel over on top of him to help it bear off. And then when he falls off the wave, he's moving in, letting the boat go flat to get up to the next wave. Have to be careful here, though. A bit too much rocking might be seen by a jury as pumping. Note the use of his main sheet as well. His main's going in and out as he luffs up and bears off. Much, much faster way of getting down the run. In this next sequence, Dave Carroll talks you through his sail controls and how they affect the sail shape, which is of itself so critical for success in OK sailing. Okay, what I'm doing now is I'm measuring the uh, position of the mast at deck level. So I'm putting a tape measure right up against the mast and extending it to the front of the boat and as you can see it's the measurement is taken from the actual where the bow intersects with the bottom of the deck so on this one it's on my mast is 680 millimeters to the intersection of the bow uh, some people have them at 69 or 70 uh, anywhere between 68 and 70 would be advisable now i'm measuring the uh, mast rake uh, I've got the mast pulled back as far as it'll go, a normal sailing, upwind sailing position. And I've got the halyard pulled right to the top by my friendly assistant. And, and I'm measuring down the mast, down this tape, and I've got a measurement here of 6 metres, 18 centimetres. The range is from 6 metres 10 to 6 metres 20. Um, and that's just measured to the, roughly on the centre line, in the middle of the transom. If you look at my mast rake, I've got about 6 metres 17 there. 
OK, Dave, we'd just like you to explain the control lines on your boat, if you would. Uh, OK, this is obviously the traveller led out to the front of the bulkhead, um, so I can adjust it easily while sailing upwind. It's obviously, you can see it's, you can cleat it in and out nicely, which is a really important function. Um, really smooth running traveller as well, which is really nice. OK, this is the out hole. Uh, nice and easy to adjust. Just a simple two-to-one system there, led through to the boom with a two-to-one on a pulley at the back of the sail. What makes it come back in, Dave? Uh, just the elasticity of the foot of the sail is making the, the out oil come in. Right. But you can have some people have an elastic boom, um, elastic tied to the maybe the shackle on the sail, which, which will pull it in for off-wind work. Okay. This is the kicker. Um, I've uh, got a, a lever arrangement on the mast with a strop coming down from the lever and a strop coming in around the um, deck bearing there. Lots of purchase. And you want, with the boom pretty much down as far as it'll go, which is roughly about there, and the kicker all the way on, you want the lever pretty much in a straight line so that it's got maximum power to keep the boom down. And I've also got a bit of elastic tied to the back of the lever, so when it frees out, it, it does tend to keep that up in a way out of the reach of the sump board. You've got a three to one, a three to two purchase, say. If you, you go for that rather than two to one, the blocks on the kicker. Yeah, I would. You, you need that power for close reaching work. Yeah. Um, probably not at Worlds or something, but in your club racing you tend to get a lot of close reaching work yeah. and things like that. Fine. Uh, I've got an in, in haul as well, which adjusts the, the uh, tack of the sail. And basically, just a simple two to one, pulls it down to the pulley. Like that. It's important that these pulleys are situated in the right place so that it gets the right angle of pull onto the corner of the sail, otherwise, it's just going to pull it in or pull it down. Um, last but not least, important control is the Cunningham. Uh, very simple, two to one again, same as the in haul. Um, got a pulley this time stitched onto this really nice north sail. It makes it easier to obviously get a bit more purchase on it, to pull more Cunningham on for the windy weather. Right, on the out haul controls, we'll talk about sail controls and what they actually do now. Um, obviously, I've showed you how the out haul works. On the end of the boom here, I've got a couple of marks. They're just for calibration purposes, so I know that when I get to the leeward mark, I can put my out oil on down the reach, and I know it's going to be roughly in the right place for the next, for the next windward beat. It's important to have those marks for consistency. How do you purposes. decide where the marks are in the first place, Dave? Oh, right. That's all to do with the rough curve of the sail, which I can show you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you how to find where to put your calibration marks on the end of your boom. Uh, firstly, I take the end haul and place that quite close, not right up to the mast, but quite close to the mark, about mast about there, so that when I pull the out haul on, I know that it's going to be in the right place. Then, obviously, I can pull the out haul on here. You see this crease? just starts to appear in the bottom of the sail. Obviously, that's, that, that's too full, and that is slightly too tight where you're putting so much stress on the sail and so much stress on the corner of the tack. So, just ease it off. So pull it on really tight and ease it off just an inch or so. Get the right sort of shape in the bottom of the sail. And then, normally, you would put a mark where that out haul starts, where, it's, where, it's, where it is for normal sailing position. These are my old positions for my old almond sail. With this new north, obviously the out horn needs to be a bit further back, so I've got to put a new mark there. Yeah. Um, and then the inner mark, how do you the, the second one of the one that comes in here, how do you identify where that's going to be? Um, or is that just a set that's distance just a, from the out, second, outer one? Yeah, that's just a second mark. If I did want to, say, in, in flat water, yeah. you can have your in all in a slightly different position. So then, obviously, if you've got the in all further back or further in, 
to get that same tightness in the foot you might need a second mark uh, on there just to make sure it's, it's right. Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do now is uh, just check roughly the luff curve on the front of the sail. Which, how I do this is, is pull, the, pull the Cunningham on until you start getting a, a tight crease in the front of the sail. You can see it's really tight right up to the headboard up there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot down the mainsail until that crease just starts to disappear in the front of the sail. Yeah. Which is about there. And then you can see from the level of the boom on the boat and there's no massive creases appearing down the front, down the whole length of the sail. And the boom's about level. That's about right for the luff curve on, on, a, on a sail. Yeah, obviously, if there was uh, too much luff curve, the, you wouldn't be able to pull the crease out. And if there wasn't enough, it'd pull the crease out so much that you'd get lots of lots of diagonal creases going into the sail. So would you normally sail up a beat with that amount of Cunningham on it then? Uh, no, only in when it's really windy. Yeah. That was just that's just literally a check just oh, to I see that, that um, the curve of the front of the sail is okay. Yeah. Okay, what we've got there now is the, the sail is really, really full. Um, you can see it's got a really big belly in it. The outhaul is off uh, and the main sheet's not sheeted down very far. There's not a lot of Cunningham on. Uh, so now we're going to start to set the sail up. Um, so what we need to do really is to sheet, sheet the mainsail down a little bit, Andy. Okay, so you can see that it's gone a little bit flatter there. Now if you pull the out haul on, you can see the sail's really starting to get a little bit flat there now. Pull it on some more. There we go, it's still going. You can see the whole thing started to flatten off without even touching the main sheet. Now as it starts, that's obviously, um, so that's about right there for light weather, medium air sailing, where it's not really flat, it's not really full, it's just nice and, nice and even uh, entry into the wind of the sail there. Now as it starts getting windier, we can, we've got maximum outhaul there, have we? Yeah. Yeah, we've got maximum outhaul on, so we're maximum on there. We can start pulling a little bit more main sheet down. You can really see that the sail's starting to flatten off now. If you keep going on that as well, all the way down to the deck, you can see how the sail is just really, really fine into the entry of the winds there. It's really flat, the leech has, leech has come around a bit. Now what happens is, if you're still overpowered, you obviously start letting the traveller off then, um, to start decreasing the, and increasing the angle of the leech onto the wind, so it gives you less heat, healing moment. Uh, and then the only thing left to you really is to start to pull the Cunningham on, which Andy will do now. If you watch the front of the sail, it's flattened it off a little bit more and it's brought the top, if you see the top of the sail, you probably didn't, didn't catch them, but it's gone dead flat. The Cunningham will flatten the top of the sail off really well. Um, obviously that's really windy weather sailing. Go back up to the other end, really light weather. So. Yeah, okay. Now, what we want to do is we'll start power. Say the wind's dropping off again, and we'll start, start powering up. First thing I would do is uh, drop the Cunningham off so you start getting a little bit of fullness in the sail, start bringing the leech back round at the top, and then start easing your main sheet so it gives you a bit of power, stops, just brings a bit more fullness into the side, into the front of the main, mainsail, as you can see. Gives you a bit more fullness in the head and in the bottom. Uh, and obviously we would start to start to bring the traveller up from there on. Okay, the boat's now really set up for medium weather sailing with a bit of chop. It's really full. Um, the top of the sail's quite hooked round, a little bit too hooked round, but that's no problem. Uh, that'll as soon as the boat start. Obviously, it's on the beach. The leech opens up as you start moving forward as well. So it's really full. Um, we've had it set up for really windy conditions. Now what happens in the lighter weather, you want to start flattening the sail off again so the wind doesn't stall in the sail. It wants to be in the sail and out of the sail as quick as possible. So what we've got to do then is um, we start just put maximum in all on, maximum out all on. Bring the traveller up slightly so it's nice and powerful and then just squeeze a bit more main sheet on to, to flatten the sail a tiny little bit. 
Now what might happen then, if you squeeze it and flatten the sail off a little bit more, the top of the sail might come round. As you can see, it's fairly hooked to windward there. So that's the point you've got to start dropping your traveller down again to get that telltale to start to fly. It's just curling around the top, which you is about right. You use that top telltale for that purpose then? Yeah, I always use, yeah, the top telltale is the, is the only real sail control I look at ever. Um, it should be not flowing out straight at the back, it should be just curling around, you see it's just curling around the back of the mainsail there, that's about, that's about correct in all weather really. And when it, in, a, in anything above a force 4 it'll just fly, continually fly anyway. But that's about right. And the bottom one doesn't really tell you much because you, you can't adjust that in relation to the top one anyway. Um, so that's how you set up the sail. Really windy, just to sum up really, windy weather, lots of outhaul, lots of Cunningham, uh, traveller right out, main sheet really far down, down to the deck, um, and then windy in medium conditions with a bit of chop in the sea or on the reservoir or lake, wherever you sail. Uh, really big fullness in the sail, quite deep at the bottom to give you lots of power. Traveller really high up to give you lots of, lots of pointing and chop. And, and then as it gets start getting the light weather again, you want to start flattening your sail off again, putting your outall back on and things like that, making sure that you don't stall the leech out by dropping your traveller off or having that bit of extra 